In my fairly extensive experience of managing Desmet's membranes detachments, I have come to realize that it's not only the desmetopexy or the air injection that is important, but equally important is the creation of the venting incisions in the mid periphery of the cornea in the area of the Desmet's membrane detachment both of which have a paramount importance in actually having a successful end result of flattening the desmids against its underlying stroma and thereby settling the desmids membrane detachment. I'd like to share this experience with you. Let's understand this a little more. Now, when you have a patient who has a desmids membrane detachment, you have the desmids that's come away from the underlying stroma. There is a potential space between the desmids and the underlying stroma, which I believe is filled with fluid. Now, if you were to only inject air in the mid periphery to settle the detachment, very often we get away with it. But if we were to also create simultaneous venting incisions in the cornea, which are full thickness incisions, we are now able to provide a path for the fluid, which is trapped between the desmids membrane and the stroma, to come out onto the anterior surface of the cornea, whilst we are injecting air, whilst performing the desmetopexy. Let's now move to discussing this case. This patient had undergone a seemingly uneventful phaco emulsification surgery and presented with corneal edema postoperatively. Despite being treated with the correct medication, the corneal edema failed to resolve. For this, we performed an anterior chamber OCT and that showed the presence of a desmids membrane detachment in the area corresponding to this corneal edema. Let's now move to watching the surgery. This, as you can see, is the entire extent of the desmids membrane detachment. Now, since it is a long-standing detachment that is almost three weeks after the primary surgery, I chose not to take any sutures because the wounds would be fairly healed. If it were a fresh detachment, however, I would have ensured that I took sutures to both the main incision as well as both of the paracentesis incisions so that I do not lose any air when I perform the desmetopexy. Let's now move to the venting incisions. The first prerequisite prior to performing the venting incisions is to have a sealed eye. That is, in case it's a very recent surgery, it's advisable to take sutures both to your main incision as well as the paracentesis incisions. The second point to note is that I typically tend to do it with an MVR blade. It can also be done with a 15 degree lens tip, but I find the use of an MVR blade a lot more controlled. Initially, when I started performing the venting incisions, I used to use a 20 gauge MVR. And now I tend to use a 23 gauge MVR as opposed to a 20 gauge MVR because all I want is a full thickness opening in the cornea. And even with the 23 gauge MVR, which should be a smaller full thickness opening, I get an adequately good end result. The next point to note is where exactly should you position these incisions. These incisions should be positioned clearly over the area of the desmid strip. That being said, I still tend to avoid the central 4 millimeters of the central cornea. I tend to place my incisions beyond roughly the 4 millimeter mark over the area of the desmid membrane strip. These incisions are made perpendicular to the cornea and they need to be full thickness but you have to ensure that you stop just once you pierce the cornea and it's important to not go through the desmid strip because that would result in a desmid membrane tear. Adequate globe stability with the help of a limb's forceps is mandatory prior to making these venting incisions. Let's now watch the venting incisions being made. After fixating the globe, watch how the MVR blade pierces the cornea. Let's look at it again in a higher magnification. Here's the MVR blade, now piercing the full thickness of the cornea. Now how do you know that you've pierced the cornea? There's a certain sense of give way as soon as you pierce the cornea. That is the point you just stop and without any slicing motions, bring the MVR straight out of the eye. You can now watch multiple other such incisions being made in that part of the cornea overlying the desmids membrane detachment.
We now move to the next part of the surgery, which is the desmetopexy. Now here's how we perform the desmetopexy. With a good counter pressure to stabilize the eye, note how this 30 gauge needle goes, traverses the cornea, then pierces the endothelium in a clear area of the cornea and an air bubble is then injected. Clearly, since this is a really small air bubble, note how I make another incision. Note how I perform a second injection at another site, again in the clear cornea, with a view of achieving a full chamber tight air fill. An important point to note is that each time you want to inject more than once, I tend to take a new 30 gauge needle. Note that this needle is connected to a 2cc syringe with air. Having entered the anterior chamber, whilst maintaining the needle in place, I continue to inject intermittently adequate air to create a tight eyeball. At the same time, I simultaneously look for little beads of fluid that appear in the area of the venting incisions. I keep wiping them off and I continue this procedure till no fluid comes out of the venting incisions. The needle is then withdrawn. Now the way in which I confirm that there is no fluid coming out of the venting incisions is by gently pressing on the side of each of these incisions with the help of a McPherson's or a limbs, opening out the lips of the incision and looking for any fluid that may appear. Two or three minutes after the air injection, you will see the cornea is starting to clear even more thereby indicating that the desmus membrane is now reattached, the endothelial pump is starting to function, thereby resulting in the corneal clearing. If you were to wait a little longer, you'll see in about five to six minutes, the cornea has cleared even more. Watch what this cornea appears like at 10 minutes after the air injection. And finally, in 15 minutes, you can see a fairly glistening cornea. This signifies the reattachment of the desmids is complete and the corneal endothelium is functioning well. And as you can see, we seem to have achieved a perfect and optimal end result of a complete reattachment of the desmids membrane at the end of this surgery. Upon the completion of this procedure, I give a subconjunctival midrocaine injection with a view of reducing the chances of creating a post-operative pupillary block. One hour after the air injection, this is what we saw. A half-chamber air bubble and a completely clear cornea. Now in a case like this where some of the air seems to have escaped out of the anterior chamber, clearly there's no need to burp these eyes. Now if this patient had a complete air fill and a very hard eye, I would then consider burping this eye. The way I do it is under a topical anesthetic, on the slit lamp, I take a 30 gauge needle and pierce the cornea and the limbus, creating a tiny paracentesis incision that just allows some amount of the air to come out of the anterior chamber. Let's look at our post-operative outcome. On day one post-operatively, as you can see, there still is an air bubble filling half the anterior chamber, but please note the cornea is completely clear and the epithelium has healed. An anterior chamber OCT was also performed on the same day, that is day one postoperatively, and it showed the complete reattachment of the desmids membrane. Let's now take a look at the venting incisions. Now this is what they look like about two weeks after surgery. We also performed ASOCT across the venting incisions and this is what we found. You can actually see a faint white line across the entire cornea representing a tiny faint scar. Even though this may be the case, clinically we have found them to be visually inconsequential. The presence of a desmids membrane detachment in the post-operative period can be a rather challenging complication to deal with, with the potential of causing visual loss as a result of corneal blindness, should it not be settled well. 
The surgeon needs to be completely aware of the exact orientation, extent and the position of the desmus membrane detachment by being there while the ASOCT is being performed in the post-operative period. One then needs to understand the importance of not only performing a perfect desmetopexy in a well-sealed anterior chamber, as well as the importance of simultaneously creating venting incisions, which would allow the fluid to egress out of the eye and thereby help the desmus membrane detachment settle well. And finally, I'd like to add that we need to lower our threshold of doubting the presence of a desmus membrane detachment when we see a patient with unexplained corneal edema in the post-operative period. With the slightest of doubt, we need to perform an ASOCT so that we can make an early diagnosis and perform the corrective surgical technique to settle this desmus membrane detachment should we find it on the ASOCT. With this, I come to the end of the video tutorial on the perfect technique of settling a desmus membrane detachment. I truly hope you found this tutorial useful. Thank you.